It's my privilege to introduce our guest today, Andrea Moore. She is founder of Performance Support Unlimited, which she has run since 1999. She's been involved in ISPI since 1992 in a variety of leadership roles. Many years ago, Andrea and I worked together at DLS Group. We even crossed Canada together on an evaluation project. <laughs> at its heart, performance-based training is about helping others in the organization perform their job tasks more like the organization's best. As IDs, we often work with exemplary performers, AKA subject matter experts or SMEs. At our best, we find ways to collaborate with them so we can represent their expertise in ways we can use to create training that helps organizations meet their business goals. But what happens in all those other cases? Andrea is going to be sharing hard-won tips and tricks for working with SMEs. During our time together, she will help you identify the qualities of your SME, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. She'll share facts about SMEs and what makes them tick, and she'll offer solutions for working with the bad and the ugly. She'll also answer your questions. Andrea, we're delighted to have you with us today. Gosh, Steve, thank you so much. I'm humbled by that introduction. And as Steve was mentioning, um, Steve and I, are, we have a, a very long history and, and traveling all the way across Canada for two weeks is an absolute true story. And we're still friends after that. <laughs> we uh, the, the thing that saved our uh, working relationship was that when we were, we, we went from East Coast to West Coast. And when, when we got to the West Coast, we were in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. We decided that it would be a good idea to part ways for the evening. So I went my way and he went his way and we uh, rejoined each other at the airport the next day and, and we're still friends. So in any case, just a, a little uh, background knowledge about uh, Mr. Dr. Steve Viachica and I. So. Um, in any case, uh, I'm here to talk about the subject matter expert uh, relationship today, and I'm, I'm glad that people are here, and, and we're going to try and, and, and have it more of a chat uh, other than, rather than a lecture. So feel free to chime in whenever, whenever you want to. Um, we're starting on the front page of the handout where we kind of separate <clears throat> qualities of good SMEs bad SMEs and ugly SMEs. And another thing that, uh, you know, sometimes we could call it a, a perfect SME, but that might be a bit of a misnomer because there's no such thing as a perfect SME. Um, I've had uh, an opportunity uh, in the past couple years, in fact, since 1998, well, no, excuse me, I'm sorry. Since 2008, I've had a relationship here uh, locally, and I'm in Denver, Colorado, with uh, the Colorado Department of Transportation. And so doing this work, I had uh, uh, exposed myself to many different types of SMEs. And um, the perfect SMEs really are, are uh, nice to work with. That's, that might be another statement, but you can see from the handout that it's uh, the qualities that make a good SME is that they are able to articulate the steps in their job. That's really what you want from a subject matter expert. As an instructional designer or a performance technologist, you're going into a project kind of, you know, as a sponge. You want to absorb all of the information that you can. And if you have a, a subject matter expert who can uh, talk about what they actually do on the job, and they can, they can present it to you in a logical format, and you can capture it and stop them and tell them to slow down and ask questions and have an interactive dialogue. That is a perfect SME. Um, also, uh, the time factor. A lot of times, subject matter experts, and, and we might find this in one of the, the bad uh, categories or the ugly categories, is you're assigned a subject matter expert because that person has a pulse, <laughs> that they're just available. And they're not the, the uh, best practice leader or a person involved in the company who knows the job. And so 
it's very ideal on the good side that uh, if this person who can articulate their job has time to spend with you and to work with you. And then also, they're going to be willing to stick it out throughout the entire process. You don't just want a subject matter expert involved during the analysis project. I mean, there it's, it's really uh, mandatory that, that you work with them during that process, but as you go along, when you're developing your materials, when you're doing some evaluation, you still want that person's uh, contribute, con contribution to the project, no matter what phase you're working on, design, development, evaluation, implementation, whatever. So. I guess uh, I, I want to start out just sharing a story of, of a, a perfect or a, a good subject matter expert that I had the privilege of working with at CDOT, Colorado Department of Transportation. Um, this person's name, and she's a very uh, 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 a bubbly person, and you might guess that based on her name. Her name is Susie. So you don't often run across professionals with, you know, names like such as Susie or Candy or, uh, you know, some kind, some of these uh, like nicknamey kind of names. But in any case, Susie uh, was a, an expert landscape architect. She graduated from um, CSU, and she uh, was assigned to the project because we were working on a stormwater management um, uh, uh, planning, uh, otherwise known as SWAMP, S-W-M-P, stormwater management planning process. And so I met with Susie and a couple of the other SMEs um, for quite some time. We used to have weekly meetings and we would go through uh, all of the, these tasks and there were probably probably 20 tasks to the job. And every task that we would have to, to talk about would take <laughs> hours to get down to exactly what the best practice steps were. And one of the things that, that made Susie into a, you know, a, an ideal SME for me was that Susie um, would go to the whiteboard and she'd start drawing out um, tables and things that we could use as job aids. So essentially, Susie became like the pinch hitter instructional designer besides me. So I thought that was excellent that, that you know, she was so engaged in the meeting that she was able to, to, to do some of that, that pre-planning and she could get inside my head and know the type of information that I was seeking from her. So. Um, that's my example of a, a, a good subject matter expert. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, we, we'd like to call these type of subject matter experts are the champions of change. Does anybody on the call have an example of a, a good subject matter expert they've worked with that they might like to share? No? Okay. I Any will. Insight? <laughs> yeah. Um... One of the last projects I did as a consultant was working with uh, detectives throughout the state of California. And our job was to complete a cognitive task analysis to represent how they uh, completed criminal investigations regardless of the crime. And we had about, you know, in any of our meetings, about a dozen or so of them in the room and we kind of sliced and diced them different ways. And we ended up finding a subset of about uh, between three to six that were the perfect SMEs. And uh, one of them uh, had an email address in the LA Police Department of Mr. Robbery because he'd been successfully solving robbery cases for 25 years and was about ready to retire. Uh, there were some others and what made them good in addition to the things you talked about that was really helpful is, you know, when we went in there, all we knew about how detectives solve crimes, you know, we learned on TV and by watching Sherlock Holmes. Uh, 
in addition to doing the things that you talk about in the handout, the other thing that these people could do that other SMEs couldn't was the ability to explain things uh, using different points of view, different words, different examples. Uh, they were able to take technical cop speak and turn it into everyday language. And some of them could draw. And that's ideal, just to, to the, the language situation. You know, a lot of times in your companies, I was, and you've heard of this, but heard this phrase before, but alphabet soup. There are so many acronyms that people just, uh, uh, you know, throw around and they expect everybody to know exactly what that acronym means. And it, it, it truly is an art to uh, speak what I would like to call plain English to people um, when, uh, if an expert can speak plain language, language to people who might not be at the same level of expertise as they are. Well, thank you, Steve. That's good. Well, let's move on to bad. And um, we can see that we've got three different types of, of qualities to the bad, the speedy SME, the scattered SME, and the shortcut SME. I want to start the conversation around the, the, the bad SME with another example from my CDOT days. Um, I, had a, a, the, uh, I was working with another gentleman who was a, a landscape architect. Um, he was involved in some of our meetings, some of the ones that I was talking about that Susie was involved in, um, but he, he was such an expert that his way of, of talking about things was truly a stream of consciousness discussion. And he was, he was the typical scattered SME. He would jump from topic to topic without uh, transitioning and, and warning people that he was really getting ready to change topics. So that's why I would call him a scattered SME. He had so much knowledge that it was, it, he, he was such an expert that he could not articulate uh, the processes that we needed him to articulate. Does that make sense? You know, somebody who is just such, he's off the chart expert. I mean, this man had been working with, at CDOT for 25 years, and everybody knew him, and he knew everybody, and he, I mean, he knew the ins and outs of, of all of the, uh, you know, politically what was going on, but golly, you know, God love him, but he could not, he could not help us focus in on, on getting down on paper what the steps were for the task. So classic scattered SME example. Anybody have any other examples of maybe a speedy SME or a shortcut SME? <laughs> Who likes the bad me type names? <laughs> Was that you, Steve? Oh boy, Jeff. You want to unmute yourself and tell us why you think you're guilty of being that guy? <laughs> I, I I see a story back behind that. Ah, uh, this is Jeff. Uh, back in the uh. Well, I was in the Air Force and we did a big push for uh TQM total quality management. You know, and I, I got on board and, uh, you know, trying to facilitate and teach. Um, I had the gumption to do it, but I didn't have the training. You know, so, so, so going through a complex slide deck, you know, an hour presentation, you know, I think the first time through, I did it in like five minutes. Oh, boy. You know, just the classic, you know, read the slides to the class and everybody's got dumb stares and, um, from that, I, from that experience, I learned the value of uh, of teaching in teams, Good. and of uh, and you know preparing your thoughts and being organized and you know review somebody else's slides before you get in front of people. Good. Well, it's always good to to come away with a an experience like that with some lessons learned. So thank you yes. for sharing that one. Anybody else uh, want to chime in on a speedy SME or a shortcut SME? 
the shortcuts me, you know, as the title um, indicates, is somebody. I, I guess that that the job becomes automatic to them, and so they basically uh, <clears throat> skip over steps that a novice um, would need to to uh, have detailed instructions about. So we we don't want if we're running into a shortcuts me. The best way to handle that is to <clears throat> try to, to to reiterate the fact that you know tell this me you know gosh you know you've been doing this so long and it, it just comes out automatically for you if we're if we're trying to bring new people up to speed how can we can we explain this job to them so that they can <clears throat> excuse me, eventually learn the shortcuts that you already know. So that might be the shortcuts me. Anybody else want to chime in? Um, I had an interesting story about a, a scattered and a shortcuts me, and it happens uh, sometimes when uh, in the ID courses I teach, when one of the team members is also uh, the team subject matter expert. And it's an interesting uh, interplay to watch uh, the team sort out the roles because uh, you've got someone who's a scattered SME and everything's important and everything's related and I can't tell you enough information. And by the way, I'll leave some steps out of it and some IDs who are trying to just get a good enough representation of exemplary performance that, you know, they, they can lay out and describe what happens on the job. It's an interesting dynamic to watch them figure out how they'll make that work. Because at first they're starting off in almost a, a opposition. Okay, thank you. Um... Aiva, has nonprofit SMEs? Yeah, I have some nonprofit SMEs that are, um, they're scattered SMEs, they're shortcut SMEs. They don't have a tendency to be impatient and moving into the ugly, they don't have a tendency to be arrogant on purpose, perhaps. Um, you know, they're not, they don't mean to be a, a sort of a water walker. It's just that in this mm -hmm. environment, everybody's got a full time job. What we're doing in our nonprofit work is secondary, and uh, because it's a nonprofit that people don't really have time for, they haven't documented over the years. They have no history, and they can't onboard their new people. So I've been working on a manual for them to help them onboard, and you can just hear task analysis coming out of that, right? Like uh, they're trying to get simple tasks done, and they have no documentation. They had nothing to hand to me except for the job. They're like, can you do this? Like, I, yes, I can. Can you tell me how? And then <laughs> what I get is the the scattered, the shortcut, and the um, sort of the reckless reviewer. Like, yeah, that's great. Um, so it just, for me, it's just been a, a slow and iterative process. Sure, sure. Well, good for you for recognizing that. So if you recognize that you've got a, a SME issue, that's half the battle, right? So you can, you can, can uh, develop tactics to overcome that. Uh, I wanted to point out in the chat, Tona can't talk to us because she's in the library, but she says that most of her shortcut SMEs have to do with a lack of patience. And so um, I don't know if any of, any of you, you others have the experience with the, the shortcut SME just not being patient enough to it reminds me kind of of a child who can't sit still. If you're in a in a room in maybe kindergarten, so it's it's uh, they can't sit still, and maybe they can't sit still because they're immature, but it may be because of the lack of patience too. Okay, well then we did uh, touch upon the the ugly characteristics here quickly in the defensive SME or the reckless reviewer SME. Um, the <clears throat> reckless reviewer SME, uh, again, that, uh, it's, it, I might be not really correct in classifying that as an ugly SME because 
somebody, a SME who's a reckless reviewer truly may be taxed for time. But <clears throat> uh, I guess to, to talk from the other side of the, the coin, uh, you really want a SME who's going to pay attention. And if, if you're taking the time to sit down and, and, and perform the analysis and collaboratively work together as a team, then the SME needs to, to devote the time to ensure that the, the steps that, that you're writing down are actually correct. So I guess we could, we could debate whether or not a reckless reviewer SME is really an ugly SME or not. So anybody have any opinions about that? I know we once had a reckless SME um, be the source of a huge uh, schedule and cost overrun. Uh, kind of looked at things and said, yeah, this looks good, made some minimal changes. We ran with uh, what he said and uh, later on found out that uh, there were some real qual problems with what he had approved. And, uh, y you know, you don't want to go to clients and say, you know, Houston, we have this kind of problem and uh, here, you know, there aren't any uh, good discussions that come out of that, you know, there's a formal change management process and you start talking about, uh, well, what else can we cut to accommodate this uh, or can you get more money or et cetera. And none of those are ever good uh, discussions to have with clients. No, no way. Well, gosh, I hope you made the guy sign something. <laughs> yeah, we did. A long time ago, we learned that uh, there are review uh, sign-off sheets that say, I have reviewed this in detail. I have noted any changes. If there are any significant uh, deviations, I understand that there's schedule and cost implications. And that's what saved us. But, you know, you can still have all the documentation you need, and it's still an uncomfortable conversation. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. It's it's about accountability, isn't it? That Indeed. the reckless reviewer SME needs to be held accountable to his or her review. For his or her review. Um, any any other tactics to to uh, get by uh, working with an ugly SME? Like let's say you have a defensive SME. They they feel like their their job's being threatened, and so they're they're really not, not being forthright and sharing information. How, how might we handle somebody who's a defensive SME? Punch them in the nose? <laughs> no, nah, we don't want to resort to violence. Anybody have any ideas? I guess what I would do for a defensive SME, if they feel their job is threatened, I would try to work on the relationship with them. Um, I would try to make sure that this subject matter expert um, doesn't feel like like you as a as a consultant, either internal or external, is going to be taking away any parts of their job. And so, I, I like I said, build on the relationship, kind of and make friends. I mean, I, and I don't mean that in a in a a comedic way, and the relationship that you build with your SMEs is inevitably very, very important. And so if you can, if you can connect with somebody, more so on a personal level, find a commonality, then maybe that might be the, the push that that uh, defensive SME would need to, to get over that particular perception that they have. So, Steve, you want to page forward to the fun facts, please? Uh, I will. Before I do, uh, T Tona suggested I try to explain that I'm on their side. And I explain that we're striving for the same goal, which is providing learners with the knowledge, the skills, the abilities that they need. Oh, OK. <laughs> and we're now on page two. Fun facts about SMEs. Thank you, Tona, for uh, uh, inserting that and to Steve for relaying it to us since she's at the library. We wouldn't want the librarian to get mad at her. So, so now we're looking at fun facts about SMEs. Um, 
these are just uh, bullet points, basically um, tips and tricks in working with SMEs. Um, uh, I talked before about using um, subject matter expert during the analysis, but there are also other roles um, within a project that you can use a, a SME. Going back to telling another CDOT story, um, once we finished our task analysis and we had the, the entire SME group uh, of, consisting of about uh, four SMEs, we were set, we were set, we had gone through review, everybody uh, had signed off on it, so we had a solid task list, and our task list consi uh, consisted of 20 different tasks. The next thing that we did with that task list in order to, we were, we were the end product was going to be an instructor-led training class, but we were very much restricted for um, the, with the time that we had for teaching the class. It, there was enough content there to probably teach for a week, but we were constricted to two days. And so the next thing that, that we did when that I worked on worked with the SMEs on is something called a criticality criticality analysis. And it's exactly like it sounds. What you, what I asked the SMEs to do was to rank each of the twenty tasks in which was uh, uh, the, the highest priority and which is, was the uh, most critical. So there's a slight difference between criticality and uh, priority. So, uh, you know, criticality is this, this particular task. If somebody doesn't do it right, does somebody die? That uh, would be an example of a high critical, critical task. Uh, Priority is if somebody doesn't do this, does it mean that um, it's going to stop the chain of work? So that's a, a high priority task. So uh, this criticality analysis, the SMEs, what the SMEs did was they ranked the 20 tasks in order, uh, they came up with a score, uh, a criticality score and a priority score. And so what we were, what we ended up doing is once we had all the tasks scored, we were able to allocate the different time blocks within our two days that we knew that we had to fit, fit that in. So uh, it's just an example of working with, with SMEs again. And, you know, the, um, Dr. Villachica, he's, you know, one of the gurus in cognitive task analysis. And it, Maybe you can spend a few minutes on how you work with SMEs uh, during cognitive task analysis, Steve. Um, sure. The uh, what we do in cognitive analysis, uh, uh, Rob Fauché helped us with, and it's essentially a procedural uh, task analysis. But when you get down to the point where you're writing decision tables, some of the decision tables are more complex. And rather than just having an if and a then, the decision tables uh, have inputs, actions, uh, questions that exemplary performers ask themselves, and outputs. And uh, the goal is you know, to sit down with people and figure out uh, what those things are. So in a cognitive task analysis, we're typically trying to work with multiple experts at the same time uh, because expertise is highly idiosyncratic. And uh, having them together kind of levels that out a bit. And when there's a disagreement, they can resolve it right there. So we'd work uh, with a group of them and we do it kind of in layers. So first, you know, what are the big uh, major tasks? What are the subtasks? And finally, we get down, uh, you know, at the level of subtask, we'd be asking, do people on the job know how to do this or not? And when we were doing this with detectives in Col California, uh, we were really looking at the transition that uh, new detectives make when they go from being uh, on patrol to detectives. So there are some things patrol officers already know how to do. And when those appeared in subtask or those appeared in steps, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time detailing them more. 
But after a while, we'd have a task list that had all the tasks, all the subtasks, all the steps. And then we start going through the steps and, you know, does a patrol officer know how to do this? And is there a, a juicy decision that they have to make? And at that point, we'd have them work with us to fill out those uh, tables. And it took several iterations to do that. And with each iteration, we'd uh, bring, we'd get rid of SMEs that were bad and ugly. We'd keep the good ones. Uh, we'd hope that there'd be some more good ones in the next group. And the next group would verify the results of the previous group. And so that's how we worked with multiple SMEs to create a larger scale cognitive task analysis. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, there's a question, how many SMEs? Uh, we typically work with about a dozen or so in each workshop. I think we had about four workshops. And by the time we were done, probably somewhere close to between 20 and 30 SMEs. Wow. That's a lot. Uh, and to do that, uh, that's that weird intersection of instructional design, performance improvement, and uh, consulting, especially client sponsorship. We were real lucky because one of the, the client side sponsors, I think, pretty much called in every favor he had in over 30 years of police work. One of the things that, that it triggered, something that Steve said that triggered in my mind, you know, we keep saying so experts, the water walkers, you know, these people who know so much. What do you think would be the best way to find out what a brand new person on the job might need to know? Maybe your subject matter expert is, is just too, too experienced to, to take a step back and, and put, put him, him or herself in the shoes of a brand new employee for a certain job. Do you think you might want to get, um, I don't know what you would even call them, novice subject matter experts? It just kind of dawned on me when Steve was talking about the cognitive task analysis because while you, you typically uh, concentrate on the exemplar performers, you also have the ones that you have to accommodate in many situations, the brand new uh, employees. Does anybody have any comments about that? Some SMEs might be able to back up and do that. Um, when Can you hear me now? Oh, hey, yeah. Jeff. Ahead, yeah, Jeff. there's a little bit of a delay. In a uh, formal walk of life, I was a formal instructor. Um, flight instructor in the Air Force. And it was very hard to sit on your hands watching the student fumble when you could do it so much quicker. Right. You know, so you don't want to shut down the student by, you know, your nonverbals of how frustrated you are. So it's just a matter of, you know, there's, there's different avenues you can do. If something is really critical and it has to happen in a, in a specific step in a certain amount of time, you know, th those are... Those are different elements, and you have to respond right away. But, but, but knowing what elements that do not have to be so time sensitive, you know, you, can, you, should, you should plan for and allow some time for them to sort it out. Um, another, another good approach is just um, having them, you know, assigning them somebody that's maybe not a supervisor, but somebody that's skilled in the task, you know, have them shadow that person for a while. And then at the end of that process, come back and then, you know, ask them some pointed questions. Mm -hmm. And and maybe even maybe have them, have them shadow different people. Because like you said, different people have a little different approach. Mm -hmm. So you can even wrap it up with the new person and ask them if they liked one approach better than the other. Or maybe develop a, an SOP from that conversation. Sure. I like that. The the coaching, mentoring aspect of things, shadowing, that's all, that's all really, really good. Okay, so Tona says, I start asking them to explain what specific terms mean and what they mean when they use jargon or certain phrases. When they stop and think about what I'm asking, then answer my question, and I tell them the answer they provided me as an example of the level of knowledge we need to deliver to the novice learner. So that's a, that's a good tactic too, Tona. Thank you. Uh, 
there are some other tactics that we've used. One is, um, if you look at the expertise literature, there's a pretty strong argument that um, there are times and places where uh, just, a, you know, people who are competent in their jobs, they're not necessarily the best, but they're good enough, uh, are better suited at, at uh, being able to uh, remember what a novice does or doesn't do. And so uh, when we were working with the cops, uh, one of our uh, review meetings with, with, was with a set of just um, journey level, uh, journey person level uh, uh, detectives. The other things that we've done is uh, we've had focus groups with novices and not to get a task analysis in terms of what is it that you do and how do you do it, but to get a sense of uh, the, the lay of that job. What's hard about it? What's easy? You know, where are things uh, frustrating? You know, are you getting, you know, where do you need help? And we've used that to uh, uh, fine tune a uh, task analysis. And the other thing we've done is we've given uh, task lists to novices and asked them to perform the task. And uh, when they can do that with minimal coaching from an outside source, you know, you've got a pretty good task list. And we're now on SME types and possible solutions. This is it, this dovetails pretty nicely into what Steve just said. Um, the not quite expert SME might not be such a bad thing. It's it's a subject matter expert, and of course you don't say it to the person, but they're good enough. They might not be an expert, but they're good enough. They're good enough to be able to explain to uh, an instructional designer who's on the, on the, the uh, team what you do in the job. You know, we're not getting to best practices perhaps, but they're just telling you the bare bones of what the task might be. So a not quite expert to me might not be such a bad thing and you might not need a solution to that is my point. There are a couple other SME types in here that we haven't talked about yet. Um, let's see. How about the interrupted SME? Now that particular subject matter expert is, is the one who is uh, typically uh, you know, multitasking during your task analysis meeting. You know, they've got their phone out, they're texting, they're, they, they're doing something on their computer or uh, doing something like that. Maybe not being a distraction to the group, but um, still uh, obviously that uh, their focus is not quite on the same uh, meeting as, as what is going on. So there's a, a few tips here to um, get over the, the interrupted SME. And, and it really does all have to do with the focus, okay? You know, you, you, you want to have some ground rules, some, you know, Steve and I, when we were um, consulting, we used to call them the kindergarten rules or the playground rules. You want to make sure that everybody either turns their phones on vibrate or has an agreement that they will not be um, accepting calls you need to um, take. Uh, you need to schedule and take breaks so that people can can step away and and get out of the room and and conduct their normal business because they really, when SMEs are, are working with you, they're they're not being productive on their jobs typically. <clears throat> we're taking. We're asking a lot of a subject matter expert. We're taking them away from their normal standard operating procedure. They're not being productive, so. And then finally, you know, for, the, for these types, and, and this is just good practice anyway, you know, don't try, if you can get around it, and you can't always, but try to limit your meeting time between two and three hours. Steve, I know you've had, and I've had these too, day-long meetings because uh, maybe you're traveling to another part of the country to meet with a certain group of people 
and you have to take advantage of that time. But if, if at all possible, keep the meeting short. Maybe you have to have more. You know, like I told you about the CDOT ones, we had uh, weekly or biweekly meetings, and they were two to three hours. But we had them, you know, every week or every other week. Anybody have any comments? And we break up long meetings so that they're doing different things. So, um, and, oh, that's a good idea. You know, we had some of them working on uh, uh, KSAs. We had others working on uh, helping us detail out the complex decision tables. Um, so, you know, we were able to kind of switch attention. Uh, the other thing uh, that really helped, uh, and it, it's funny, uh, it's an interrupted SME thing, but food is good. Give them <laughs> food. Show up with coffee. Uh, it goes a long way to say that you respect somebody's time. Uh, re years ago, uh, Andrea and I worked with a guy named Art, and Art was doing a task analysis at a refinery in Denver, and we're trying to be accommodating and so Art is showing up at two in the morning on a graveyard shift because he can get his work done without interfering with all the normal operations. Uh, and uh, no one would talk to Art, even though he's a really nice, approachable guy. And then Art found the miracle of donuts. <laughs> and suddenly everyone wanted to talk to Art. And oh, Aiva too believes in the power of feeding the group. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. It, it's uh, it's interesting. Steve and I, you know, because we spent uh, so many years together at the consulting firm, uh, we have some of the same uh, moral fiber in our characters, and uh, providing food is is definitely one of them. So. I guess um, before you know, we, we wrap up today, I have one more SME type that isn't on the handout that I wanted to, to mention to the group. And this um, SME, I don't have a, a, a clever name for this SME, so bear with me here for a minute. What should you do with the SME who wants to be the instructional designer? What do you do with the SME that is uh, kind of sort of trying to do your job. Any comments? I know I talked about that with Susie, but just wanted to talk about that a little bit more. Anybody? Jeff's here. Please. You can let them do it if they know how. How do you know they know how? Well, that's another question. <laughs> <laughs> um, have they done that kind of work? Have they done that work before? Mm -hmm. Or if you can provide them, I don't know, say a, say a template, you know, if you have a, say, an established template that you want the information to be in, you know, but if they want to, if they want to work on it and get, get creative and do all the stuff in there, you know, find, find a way to harness that energy. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, you know, they might take an issue if you want to be a, you know, edit them at the end of the process. Yeah, right. But, uh, but like, you know, if they have all that energy, it'd be a shame to let it go to waste. Just make sure you can provide, uh, like, like lay the ditches. You know, they want to, if they want to go down the road, you, you know, lay the ditches, let them know what the, you know, what the expectation is. Probably just a, I don't know, seat of the pants, just in time kind of situation, depending on how much, how well you know the person or their background or what kind of work they've done before. Um, did everybody see it? Tona's uh, chat response. Uh, Tona is talking um, about the, let me page down here, the reckless SME situation. She says, um, this is one of my challenges. I work for the Air Force, and what they do is send, somewhat, send a somewhat seasoned technician from the field to what we call the schoolhouse to become instructors. They also act as the resident SME. When they're designing and developing a course, they are the SME resource. She often finds herself in the situation when SME isn't really a true <clears throat> SME, but because they're local and all she has to work with, I guess, AKA, they, it's somebody who's available, which we talked about earlier, 
Um, how does uh, how do I know that the course content I'm providing is truly reflective of what the career field needs? This is particularly hard when my SME is a reckless SME or a water walker. As a non-SME, I can only trust that what I'm getting is the best information. So she understands. Very, uh, very articulate. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we did in that situation is uh, we will uh, send out uh, the a survey asking people who perform the job uh, to look at uh, what we've come up with and just rate it in terms of, uh, yeah, this is exactly what I do close enough or, you know, on the other side of it, not at all like what I do. And it's called, uh, that part of task analysis is called job analysis. So if you feel like you're really proceeding at risk, uh, maybe there's a suggestion uh, of uh, coming up with some procedures to validate the task list before you accept it as gospel. Right. We did something similar to that at CDOT. Once we had our task list, um, <clears throat> we sent out, because, I mean, truly, we were working with four subject matter experts. We had a whole host of, of CDAT people who were involved in water quality in some way or another, who were interested in stormwater management planning. So what we ended up doing is we sent out a survey that said, here's what we've come up with, this, this small group of ours. Can you tell us uh, you know, what's missing? What, what do you agree with? What do you disagree with? And things like that. And so it, the, the point of that is that even though you're working with a small group, you're getting another data source to validate your findings. So SMEs can be very remote as well. That's pretty much all I want to talk about. Um, I guess I wanted to, to offer um, if there's anybody out there who needs any, any help in your uh, task analysis or job analysis, if you want to run anything, um, by me, by the group, then uh, now might be the time that you do that. So anybody out there who wants to, to say anything? Oh, nobody needs help. That's good, I guess. You're all very much handling things on your own, and that's terrific. Well, I guess to wrap up, um, I'll just uh, say that um, we've, we've had a, a discussion about our good SMEs, our bad SMEs, and our ugly SMEs today. I think we have some tactics uh, that we discussed to work with, uh, with them, work around them sometimes in some cases. Um, we also talked about um, different tips and tricks in working with SMEs, and we shared some experiences um, uh, between the group of, of our uh, particular uh, situation of working with different types of SMEs and, and what some of the, the things that we needed to overcome during those particular projects. So I want to thank you very much for your time and attention. And please feel free. Um, I believe my email is um, in the description. Um, if, if it's not, it's very easy. It's my first name, Andrea, A-N-D-R-E-A -E dot M-O-O-R-E at A-T-T -T dot net. Uh, and I guess with that, we've come to the end of our webinar, and I'd like to thank you all for being here. Yep. I give my thanks as well. Thank and you for putting this together. Our pleasure. And Andrea, thanks for sharing your expertise and your support of our OPAL students and graduates. My pleasure indeed. Okay. Bye-bye, all. Bye, everybody.